Hello and welcome. Um, my name is Linnell Hartway. I'm a program manager at the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges, and I work in the Family Violence and Domestic Relations Department. Hello, my name is Jan Morris. I'm the program director for the Tribal Justice Partnership Programs here at the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges. Uh, I'm pleased to be a part of this webinar. Um, just by way of uh, introduction, I am a retired judge. I've spent 30 years working in tribal courts, various tribal courts, and spent uh, 20 years <clears throat> uh, as a tribal judge, both a trial judge and appellate judge, again for various tribes, uh, mostly in Arizona. But uh, I've seen a lot of, uh, had a lot of experience in tribal courts, so hopefully uh, if you have any questions uh, as how this pertains, Within a tribal court setting, I'll be able to answer those for you. Um, so today's presentation is looking at overrepresentation and the Indian Child Welfare Act to best end promising practices for tribal grantees. Um, as the blurb uh, indicated, this presentation was originally presented at a Family Violence Prevention and Services Program Tribal Grantees meeting um, this August, last August in Seattle. Our presentation audience was directed to tribal grantees of the program, which included advocates for domestic violence victims, other tribal advocates, social services workers, and those working both within and outside tribes, um, but within and for tribal communities. And so the presentation was geared towards that audience. Um, as a little bit of background information, the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges um, operates the RCDV CPC, the Resource Center on Domestic Violence, Child Protection, and Custody. It is a special interest resource center funded by the Department of Health and Human Services. And its purpose is to provide training and technical assistance um, to all levels, and um, that includes national, state, tribal, and local communities about the intersection of domestic violence and child protection and custody. Um, that includes judicial resources, um, we tailor assistance for programs, and we do research and individualized consultation. Um, so it's just a little bit of background about Resource Center, which is uh, backing this presentation and our webinar here. Um, today's learning objectives include understanding the history of overrepresentation of Native American communities in state child welfare matters, recognizing the intersection of child welfare and domestic violence and the ways in which trauma informed systems can better respond. Evaluating ICWA is an opportunity to decrease the impact of overrepresentation on children and families who experience violence and exploring best practices by tribes and tribal courts in relation to collaborative efforts to address victim trauma in children and families involved in state and tribal welfare cases. Um, as we saw from the focus of the Resource Center and then the topic of discussion, um, the Resource Center is focused in on the intersection within systems and system responses to domestic violence and its impact on children and families. So we are looking at ICWA from that perspective um, to discuss how ICWA can be used in, in ways that improve those outcomes. Uh, as a background part of any domestic violence discussion, as advocates, of course, know very well, um, context matters, and context is key in any discussion of the start and understanding of domestic violence issues and systems response. And as we know, DV or IPV is not limited to physical abuse. It can include psychological, emotional, cultural, and economic abuse. It has many different faces and many different impacts. In terms of the intersection between DV and child welfare, context is important in the assessment of risk 
and increases the need to differentiate between the forms of domestic violence or IPV present in a family and to collaborate um, effectively to assess safety and assist with safety planning. So the context of the DV matters, of course, as does its nature and the response, and um, particularly when looking at a child welfare case that may not present as a DV case, the assessment of risk and the response to that risk is, of course, dependent on determining the nature and extent of that DV. Um, in terms of context and domestic violence, it is, of course, important to understand that different um, types of DV affect different populations differently. And everyone, I'm sure, is familiar with the wheel of control and power. Um, what you have on your screen is a DV-centered adaptation of that wheel of power and control that is meant to look at the specific types of domestic violence that may be present within the Native American community and with American Indian Alaska Native populations. And of course, that includes a focus on um, cultural context for abuse and the ways in which that abuse can um, impact those types of cultural practices and um, may be, may impact be the cultural abuse upon the victim as well as its impact within the community and the community's response. So the American Indian and Alaska Native populations, women primarily, um, are overrepresented and, by, and, and impacted by domestic violence with 47% of that population reporting experiencing IPV over their lifetime. Um, they are more likely to experience domestic violence and sexual violence at higher rates than women of other ethnicities and groups. And they're also less likely to seek the assistance and services that they need in response to that victimization. And as you can see, the disproportionality or overrepresentation of that population is at least three and a half times higher than the national average in Native American communities. So the intersection of that domestic violence and a little bit about the impact that that has on child welfare and children's exposure to violence. Um, of course, going back to context and trying to look at the underlying impacts within the community and that system response. Uh, what we know from the Special Criminal Jurisdiction five-year report on uh, VAWA's implementation within tribal communities is that 58% of the incidents that were tracked by those tribes that were implementing their special jurisdiction involved children. It's not specified in the report exactly what that means, and that can, of course, go anywhere from um, children being victimized themselves within those, um, within those cases to just being involved as a witness um, because of the multiple types of ways in which childhood exposure to IPV exists within a household. Um, just witnessing, seeing, feeling the impact within the house, hearing that violence within the, the house or within the neighborhood, of course being told about it either directly or indirectly through exposure to other members of the community. There's prenatal exposure, direct victimization, um, forced participation, which is particularly an issue with coercive controlling abuse, and then of course dealing with the aftermath. And 31% of children who witness domestic violence or um, intimate partner violence report being physically abused themselves. So after laying out the context and the within which systems responses, we are going to go a little bit further back. So because we are uh, addressing the issue of domestic violence within tribal communities, um, there are some other uh, historical concepts that need to be addressed because um, our, our tribal histories um, kind of inform and, and build uh, the foundation of 
what uh, our communities are about, what our families are about. And in this context, uh, we have to look at historical or what's also called intergenerational trauma. You can see from the pictures, uh, the picture on the left there is the Carlisle Indian Boarding School in Carlisle, Pennsylvania that opened in the 1870s. Uh, and beginning from that time forward, um, it was a federal policy, and in fact, in, uh, at least as uh, early as uh, 1891, there was federal legislation that appropriated money and directed reservation agents to gather up Native children on the reservations and send them to boarding schools. It was a federal mandate. It was um, the, the federal law that uh, Native children had to go to boarding school. Uh, in addition to um, the boarding school issues, there were a number of other um, federal policies which um, added to the historical trauma um, of tribes. Um, just the, uh, the development of the reservations for many tribes that were somewhat nomadic uh, in, their, um, in their existence, uh, either because they were following animals or following, um, you know, the seasons uh, in terms of their subsistence. Uh, it was a real um, strain for tribes to be confined to a particular plot of ground, a reservation that was created supposedly for their, uh, for their protection, but um, basically did away with their entire um, system of life previously. So just being corralled onto the reservations was uh, a bit of a traumatic experience in itself. Um, following in beyond that, um, we get into the, um, you know, that's compounded with the boarding school issues as well, but then uh, later into the 20th century, we had the uh, relocation programs where uh, young adults and, and tribal families were relocated to various communities, uh, urban communities throughout the country, including Seattle and Minneapolis and Oakland and Cleveland, uh, just a number of different sites around the country that were designated as relocation centers. And again, federal money was uh, spent and programs were developed to relocate Native families into these urban areas, um, primarily um, to provide um, a I guess a civilization to, to, to give the, these families an opportunity to, to learn job skills or to have additional education in order to assimilate into the mainstream American lifestyle. Um, then in the uh, 1950s, we also had the, the termination era where Congress actively um, passed legislation that simply obliterated uh, over a hundred tribes, um, they ceased to exist because of federal legislation. The idea um, being twofold, again, is that uh, those individuals who for belong to these former tribes would either uh, would simply assimilate into the American society, and uh, number two, so the federal government was no longer responsible for that trust relationship that was built through uh, treaties and other legislation. So we see this pattern throughout history of the federal government um, separating tribal people from, uh, tribal families from their, from their people and their homelands. And this accumulation of, of traumatic events uh, has passed down intergenerationally through our communities. And so you know, even now we can still speak to our elders in our communities about relocation and about boarding school experience uh, and realize that that did effect, uh, cause some traumatic effect within our families. So not only do we have individual um, trauma, but we also have this social trauma, this historical trauma that has um, afflicted our tribal communities. In addition to that, um, there is uh, 
the personal trauma that individuals and families can experience as well. And, you know, the trauma doesn't necessarily take one form. It can take several different forms. Um, as you can see on, on the slide, there are a number of factors that may exist within any particular family or any particular tribal community that is going to um, have a have a tendency to, to create uh, trauma within a, a family or within a person's lives, including things like poverty or neglect. Um, you know, most tribal communities have a, a serious shortage of housing uh, and education and sometimes medical um, benefits as well. It's difficult to find jobs. Um, and so without jobs, without adequate housing, uh, without adequate education and medical care, uh, the poverty and neglect creates trauma within itself. There's also substance abuse, and I think we can all agree that we know someone uh, within our tribal communities who has uh, had substance use disorder issues, whether it's our parents uh, or our relatives or even just our caregivers. And uh, just as an insert, when we originally presented this um, with at the tribal grantees meeting, we were also participating in a guided discussion. And one of the issues that was raised by the advocates and the guided discussion was that in almost all of the cases that they are become involved in, um, including the social services workers, where there is issuance of domestic violence and or child protection matters, substance abuse played a role. Yeah, very pervasive, and just based on my own experience, I think that's um, that's very true. Um, thinking back now, as I as I do think about it, probably a hundred percent of our child neglect or dependency cases were uh, involved some aspect of substance abuse, either by parents or by relatives within the household, because you know very often there are two or three generations of of a family living together in one household. And even if it's not directly the parents involved, sometimes it's it's uh, aunts and uncles and parents and grandparents and uh, other relatives who are involved in substance use or substance abuse that's creating the trauma within the household. There's also a domestic violence, which Linnell touched on earlier, and, and kind of what we were focusing on was that intersection between domestic violence and child neglect and child dependency cases. That domestic abuse can be between parents, it can be between relatives, again, if you're living in someone else's household because of a lack of, of funding or a lack of available housing. Uh, you really don't have a lot of choice sometimes where you're going to live. And uh, because it's not your house, you don't have the control over what goes on in your house. If you're staying with relatives and there's domestic violence and substance abuse going on there, you really don't have a choice but to uh, learn to, to uh, not accept it but to live with it. It's part of the existence uh, of living in that household. And sometimes that domestic abuse can even involve the child as a victim, um, which we, we don't like to see, but um, um, very often the domestic violence is between the parents, uh, but sometimes the children can become involved as well. That creates personal trauma. Uh, and unfortunately, um, we're all aware of sexual abuse that takes place in our tribal communities. Sexual abuse can be by a caregiver uh, or by some other power figure uh, who is the perpetrator within our communities. It could be someone from the local Boys and Girls Club. It could be a coach uh, at, the, at the school. Uh, it could be a religious uh, leader within uh, a, a more Christian uh, or Western religion uh, leader, a pastor or a, a priest. Um, who is uh, perpetrating sexual abuse on our on our tribal kids and young people, uh, or it can and it can be. Uh, I mean, statistics have kind of indicated that um, it's usually uh, that it's uh, a large number of sex abuse cases involve uh, family members. 
uh, as the perpetrator, unfortunately. So we have this, uh, all of the, these traumas that are going on. We have the personal traumas. Uh, we have the intergenerational historical traumas. We have the, the social community trauma going on. We have all of these other issues that are uh, leading into that, including the, the poverty and the, the joblessness and, and, uh, and the isolation uh, of some of our uh, tribal communities, uh, where we don't have access to a lot of services. That all has uh, an impact. That's all, as we said, the context matters. And the impact that that has on children and families is that um, we tend to see a lot of uh, neglect and dependency situations as a result of that. That leads to disproportionality, which is the under-representation or over-representation of a racial or ethnic group compared to its percentage in the total population. So um, very often, um, I mean, it does happen within our tribal communities, obviously, but <clears throat> sometimes uh, families will move into town, uh, into the closest town off the reservation in order to pursue jobs or health care. Or uh, sometimes you just go in on the weekends to go shopping. Uh, and Sometimes um, our kids can get caught up into the child welfare system when, uh, when tribal people relocate, uh, either permanently or temporarily off the reservation. As our children um, become swept up in the, in the state child welfare process, um, tribal people tend to represent a very small percentage of the state population, <coughs> excuse me, but when we look at the numbers of kids that are in foster care or involved in the child state child welfare systems, we find that they represent anywhere from uh, 10 to <coughs> over 50 percent, depending on the state or different locations within specific states. So that's disproportionate. Uh, we have way more tribal kids that are in the state child welfare system than would be indicated by the, the population of Native people in that particular state. Uh, American Indian uh, and Alaska Native children experience child abuse and neglect at a rate of 16 and a half <clears throat> per 1,000 children, which is a very high rate. <clears throat> uh, we have fall coming on here in Reno. We're based out of Reno, Nevada. We have fall coming on, and I'm having my fall allergies. <laughs> I apologize for that. <clears throat> American Indian, Alaskan Native uh, disproportionate rates for foster care placement have increased in state systems in the past 10 years from 1.5 to 2.5. So you can see it's a very prevalent component of state child welfare systems and foster care systems uh, is the number of uh, Native kids involved in that process. What is uh, additional, there are ad additional impacts on children and families. The effects of chronic exposure to violence include increased rates of altered neurological development, poor physical and mental health, poor school performance, substance abuse, and overrepresentation in the juvenile justice system. So kids, uh, our Native kids also get caught up into some delinquency type activities, whether it's uh, related to drug abuse or simply hanging out with the wrong group of, of other kids. Um, that's what the juvenile justice system is about. And so we see this, uh, the impact uh, spilling over into the juvenile justice system as well. And it has all of these other um, issues. Um, very often our kids uh, are disadvantaged uh, educationally anyway, but uh, as this trauma and exposure to violence increases, it also increases um, the neurological development, the development of the brain of our kids, and it, and it can impact um, how they learn and how well they can learn. Uh, and it leads to the poor physical and mental health issues. 
American Indian Alaska Native children experienced post-traumatic stress disorder at the same rate as veterans returning from Iraq and Afghanistan and triple the rate of the general population. So, you know, if you if you see the news reports on TV or you read it in, in publications about PTSD and how it's affecting our service uh, people coming back from the Middle East, uh, just keep in mind that uh, statistics have now indicated that uh, American Indian children experience PTSD at the same rate as those veterans, just based on their household and community situations. So what are some concerns regarding uh, our system's response? Well, domestic violence victims may not report abuse because of their fear of losing custody of their children if they don't admit their children witnessed the violence, or if they admit that the children. So if you had a domestic violence, let's say that the family has moved in into town, uh, or it could be even within the, within the reservation, um, domestic violence occurs within the household. The kids see what's going on. The kids are witnesses to that. But <clears throat> the victim of that domestic violence either doesn't want to report the, the abuse or doesn't want to admit that the kids witnessed it for fear that uh, that the children will be removed from the home. Child welfare involvement has often led to removal and resulted in more trauma to the family. So every time there is uh, a, a change of placement with kids, if they are removed from the home, even if they're placed with other family members, that removal creates an additional trauma on the kids. Uh, though case plans are considered voluntary before adjudication, it doesn't feel that way to the parents. So you have social workers who are saying, uh, or child welfare workers who are saying, let's work on this plan, this reunification plan, this child safety plan that's going to have you uh, taking uh, part in certain services uh, that we think will improve the quality of your household. Um, and so you you need to you you really need to get on board with these things. Um, that's really just a kind of a, a form of coercion because the 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 threat uh, and it's not always a, a hidden threat is that if you don't comply, if you don't participate, if you don't go through these services and, and follow our plan, we're going to remove your children from you, or we're going to uh, make sure that they don't go back into your household. The survivor uh, parent's life is under scrutiny. So if a, uh, if, if a, let's say, for instance, a mother is the victim of domestic violence within the household, um, she's going to feel that her life is under scrutiny, that everyone sees, that the kids are looking her, at her a certain way, that family members uh, are aware and, and thinking about her in a certain way. And that information, as we know, kind of, tends to spread around within tribal communities. And suddenly, uh, she's thinking that the whole community is aware of what's going on and how that's uh, affecting her. Consequently, the system response may not be trauma responsive. So in, not only do we have to deal specifically with, uh, with services that might be needed, whether it's uh, housing assistance or education assistance or uh, helping the family obtain food. Um, we also need to address, because all of this trauma has taken place, we need, uh, our system response needs to include a component that is trauma responsive, that will address the trauma, and the system needs to be trauma responsive so that it, uh, the system itself creates uh, less trauma, or at least doesn't add to the existing trauma. Uh, that takes place in these situations. The Indian Child Welfare Act um, was enacted by Congress um, in part to address these, um, these issues that have led to the removal of children, uh, native children from, from their parents. So ICWA is a remedy for mistakes made on both the federal and state policy and practice 
resulting in American Indian and Alaska Native children being removed from tribal communities. So as we know, there was a lot of uh, uh, tribal uh, kid removal, uh, especially during the 40s, 50s, and even into the 1960s, continuing into the 70s, where uh, a great majority of children that were involved in the state um, child welfare system and the, and the um, foster care system uh, were being adopted out. They were being, uh, the parental rights were being terminated and, and the children were losing con connection and contact with their tribes and their tribal communities. Uh, ICWA was designed as a remedy for all of these um, faulty federal policies that took place in the past. The ICWA provides for exclusive tribal court jurisdiction in certain situations, provides for the transfer of state child welfare cases to the tribal court. So it could be at the request of a tribe, or it could be at the request of, actually it could be the request of any party. It could be the state child welfare workers as well that ask uh, for the case to be transferred to the tribal court. Uh, and we can talk about uh, maybe a little bit later why why that can be a really good idea. <clears throat> Tribal government intervention in state child welfare, welfare proceedings. So the ICWA requires the state court or the state uh, child welfare agency to notify the tribe uh, and that they have the right to intervene in that proceeding and either uh, take an active part in those proceedings to make sure that all of the requirements of ICWA are being met or uh, requesting transfer of that case back to the tribal community. It also sets out some specific out-of-home placement preferences. So if there is going to be out-of-home placement of, of a native child in the state child welfare system, uh, the, the state court or the state agency has to follow uh, this uh, preferred placement um, that's uh, set out uh, set out in the uh, federal law. And it also provides for full faith and credit of tribal court child custody orders. So if there was a prior uh, order in existence, whether it's custody, uh, you know, it could be exclusive custody, sole custody for a mother, father, could be custody that was awarded to an aunt uh, or a grandparent. Um, it could be a guardianship type order, which uh, also includes the uh, custody component. Any of those things that previously existed uh, through the tribal court before the state court action, um, the ICWA requires the state court to give full faith and credit to those tribal court orders. Let's talk about the ICWA and systems response. ICWA can be uh, at its decision points, uh, and that is whether it's a transfer to tribal court, whether it's placement uh, out of the home, uh, any of those decision points, an opportunity to design and implement programs and practices to better address domestic violence, trauma, and child welfare. And it does this through stronger efforts to promote reunification when it's appropriate. It also does it through uh, protocols requiring collaborative wraparound victim mental health and behavioral health services built into trauma responsive safety and reunification plans. So remember we talked about how these reunification plans or child safety plans were being devised by the state workers. Um, we need to make sure that all of the services that they're going to need uh, are going to be a part of those plans. And that includes, you know, the wraparound services. It's going to require mental health services, behavioral health services, and it needs to, to address the trauma component, both for kids and for families and for parents. And uh, finally, a better chance to minimize victim or survivor trauma. So as our systems become more responsive to the trauma, uh, that occurs through domestic violence, uh, we have a better chance to minimize trauma by making sure that our systems are more responsive to those trauma um, issues. <clears throat>
ICWA requirements frequently addressed by state and federal appellate courts are also where programs and services can be involved. So some of the things that we see really um, taking place that are questions, things that are being uh, litigated in state court systems involve the, the <clears throat> at what point uh, is there inquiry or notice uh, whether or not there's an Indian child involved in a state court proceeding uh, and all of the components with regard to that inquiry, what steps have to be taken by, by state courts or state agencies um, when they have reason to believe that a child may be an Indian child, uh, how that notice is supposed to take place. Um, also at the point of transferring a case or a request to transfer or a request to intervene by a tribe or a parent. Uh, active efforts and reasonable efforts. The ICWA makes the distinction that active efforts to um, prevent removal of the child need to be demonstrated to the state court, uh, which is a higher standard than most state courts use uh, in their child welfare systems, which only requires a reasonable effort. Um, there's also uh, pre-adjudication placement and post-adjudication placement and so, um, again, the ICWA is very specific about uh, what types of placements. With, there's a preference of, of uh, family members or community members that may be an appropriate placement. And also the use of qualified expert witnesses because um, that expert witness needs to come in and be able to tell uh, a state court judge whether or not continued presence of the child in their home is going to continue to be detrimental to their health. And that needs to incorporate some, uh, some community social standards uh, and traditional child rearing standards as well. So all of those things are built into the ICWA, which are designed uh, to help state courts deal with, this, with the um, um, particular issues that our, our tribal kids face. Um, and so, in the analysis of ICWA and, of course, its implementation, we understand that, you know, ICWA's responsibility for ICWA implementation lies with state courts, and they're the primary responsibility for understanding its provisions and implementing its requirements don't lie with tribes. However, what we're looking at through this lens of trying to um, address domestic violence and system response in child welfare matters, especially in ICWA, is ways in which um, tribal responses and programs um, can interact with the state courts and their systems in order to basically overall improve practice um, and thereby reduce trauma. Um, and that's basically what we term at the council and often refer to as best practices. So we're taking a look at those options. So in terms of the particular steps of ICWA, um, for those who are familiar with it um, or unfamiliar with it, and often the first step is the notice and timeline. You've got a requirement for initiation of emergency removals or other matters in which the state is looking to intervene um, in a case involving a family, and parents, custodians, and tribes must receive notice 10 days prior to a hearing, um, and that there may be a request for additional time. Um, BIA must also now be notified um, um, if the child's tribe is unknown, and that's part of the updated uh, guidelines that have been issued by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. So in terms of looking at those decision points and the application of ICWA by a state court, um, and if you're a tribe or working within a tribal system or a child um, or a domestic violence advocate, there's an opportunity here to design and implement protocols that require collaboration between the legal side and the services side of child welfare, and establish a requirement for intertribal notification to service providers on those notices. Um, so if, if the idea here is you've got a finite amount of time um, on a notice requirement for an ICWA matter that's sitting in front of a state court, tribes have a chance to take a look at their own internal process and look at how do we do design a system of notice transmittal between systems within the tribal programs 
in order to make sure that the people who need to know about that notice um, get it and, and the necessary information is provided as quickly as possible to those who need to know. Um, to that in order to make sure that all of the tribes programs, multidisciplinary decision makers are notified and involved from the beginning um, to get those notices processed as quickly as possible to those uh, departments and programs that need to know um, and to provide state agencies and courts with the information that they therefore need um, and in response to the notices but also then before that starts getting the information to the state courts and, and agencies so they know who to talk to themselves. Um, so if a state court has to have notice that within 10 days and they don't know who those notices go to, um, the guidelines and the requirements of course say there's a BI ICWA uh, notification list that can be found um, and that can be pointed to um, very quickly. Um, however, tribes who work um, in tandem with state agencies on a regular basis can also make sure that there's co additional communication between the programs so that they're familiar with the tribe's policies, they're familiar with the tribe's programs, they, they know who it is that they can be reaching out to. A simple way, of course, is to put that on a website if the tribe has that information. Um, here's who you need to call if you have an ICWA matter and um, a very simple statement. Um, depending on, of course, the tribe's procedures for notice and on the timeline, this is usually the Indian Child Inquiry, of course. Um, that includes not only interaction between the social services department, but whomever it is responsible at the tribe for determining enrollment um, eligibility and or enrollment status. So that's what we mean by multidisciplinary and, and across services to make sure that all of the people who are involved in, in those determinations know from as, as soon as possible. And I've had an opportunity to work with um, different tribal child welfare agencies that say, you know, we have a, a really good relationship with our counterparts on the state side. Uh, the state child welfare workers and the, and the tribal welfare workers are, you know, they, they call each other, they talk to each other, they email each other, they communicate very well. So those models do exist out there, but what we're trying, again, to, to um, to emphasize is that those should be created as protocols um, so that everybody, um, and even those, because as we know, there's turnover in, in tribal employment and turnover in state employment, and so the next person taking that position may not uh, follow that that um, that informal process, but if it, you make it a formal process, then uh, hopefully they will follow it. And of course, all of this is designed um, in terms of looking at both impact to domestic violence victims and impact to children. If, if the process that you've created and, um, and protocol that you understand involves informal um, cooperation and decision making between systems, then it's that much more likely that the, um, the matter can be resolved quickly um, as opposed to going on to the next step. So any, any step that you can take in order to cut short the system response in order to get either services in place or reunification um, to an appropriate placement or placement within a family um, immediately so that the impact is lessened on the child is, of course, a way to improve um, response to the child and response to the victim. And that's, uh, again, the, the, that's why it's really important for the internal tribal process to be a, a collaborative process so that uh, if there are service providers within the community, both uh, in terms of, of cultural services as well as behavioral health uh, and, and trauma, um, trauma responsive services, uh, all of those can be designed, can be put together. Everyone can collaborate and come up with a, with a wraparound uh, services program that can be presented to the state court to, to help them uh, either place the child, make sure the child is placed within the community or transfer the case back to tribal court so that, that all of those cultural components can be incorporated uh, to address uh, the domestic violence situations that, that are creating uh, or lending themselves to these situations. Um, so after the, the notice and timeline um, starts and the inquiry, you've got the question of transfer to tribal court. 
um, the basics of, of ICWA and its regulations is that that transfer may be requested at any time during the process by a parent or by a tribe. Um, a tribal court must receive notice in writing of the request. Um, and the transfer must occur unless either parent objects, the tribal court declines, or there is good cause to deny the transfer. And so those are the, the actual um, ICWA guidelines that state courts need to consider for those transfers. And that's, that's of course, once it has gone to the court for a transfer process. And as we discussed about the informal process or the collaborative process, of course, there is transfer options for uh, tribes working with social services departments directly or with other state agencies before it gets to the adjudication stage. Um, when considering the, tri the transfer process, um, you know, aside from the factors that occur in the state court and looking at an argument about whether or not to transfer, what tribes can look at in terms of how to implement this requirement of ICLA and, and their authority under it is to design their own procedures uh, for the handling of the petitions of transfer and for intervention. Um, tribal courts and tribal communities, of course, all have different levels of service availability and response requirements and or limitations. Um, and so when a tribe is considering what, if there are a tribe in which they are likely to have cases that are interacting with state courts and take a look at their own uh, services and, and processes for the availability of placements um, and for consideration of the best interests of the child, including physical, mental, and emotional needs and extraordinary levels of those needs. And so taking a look at your own internal um, procedures, taking a look at your own services and trying to design a set of protocols and uh, requirements for assessing a transfer request as opposed to a blanket or mandatory acceptance, which of course doesn't include for those variables, such as the best interest of the child and the actual availability of options. Uh, it also imperm uh, impermissibly interferes with judicial discretion. Um, you know, the judge's job in the room is to determine uh, not only best interest of the child, but also the availability of services within his purview. Um, and so looking at transfer in terms of how to improve system response um, doesn't, doesn't lead to blanket. Every time you get a transfer, we must take it. Therefore, um, we do. So one of the provisions of ICWA, as I mentioned before, deals with what are called active efforts. So for a state court child welfare proceedings, prior to any involuntary placement or termination of parental rights, the state agency must state on the record to the court what active efforts have been made to prevent the breakup of the Indian family. So it's not just a matter of uh, we came in, you know, we got a call from the police department and this the uh, situation was going on in the, in, in the home and uh, we swooped in and took the kids out because we felt they were in danger. Um, you can't just do that. You have to, they, they now have to assess the situation and see if there were any efforts, anything that they could have done to prevent that removal. If there were any services that they could have, uh, programming they could have offered to the parents or the children uh, to uh, prevent that removal in the first place. Maybe it's a shelter for, for a battered spouse that accepts children along with, with the, uh, the victim. Um, you know, there are just a number of different um, services that could be available that, uh, where removal of the children would not have been necessary if the uh, state agency worker had, had exercised these active efforts. They must also document in detail on the record the remedial services and rehabilitative programs that have been offered or provided. So they need to be very specific about programming or services being offered through the state or the county uh, and what those services or programming is going to do for the family. 
um, that, and particularly, again, keeping in mind the cultural needs of the community and the children, the connectedness with their community, the connectedness with their, uh, with their Indian families. Uh, and um, that the efforts have been unsuccessful. So they can't just say, uh, well, the parent didn't show up. Um, you know, I, I offered these services and the parent just didn't show up. Well, an active effort requires that worker to find out why the parent didn't show up if they can. It could have been a transportation issue, something as simple as I didn't have a bus pass to get there. Uh, it could be that uh, I was uh, at the child welfare, uh, I was at the, uh, the state agency trying to get uh, uh, food stamps or WIC for my kids and, uh, and I was waiting in line too long. The, the line was too long and and I didn't want to lose my place, so I missed the appointment. I mean, it could be something like that. It could be those types of things. It's the active effort of the state worker uh, must be um, to determine why those servicing services were not successfully um, accepted and participated in by the parent. Here are some examples of reasonable efforts versus active efforts. Uh, a reasonable effort might be to give contact information to a parent for victim services. So let's say the state, uh, the state uh, agency worker meets with mom who is uh, the victim of domestic violence and says, here are some, uh, here's a list of victim services available, uh, some shelters, some food banks, uh, and some uh, mental health, uh, behavioral health, individuals that you can go see. Here's a list. Uh, they have phone numbers. Here's the addresses. It tells you how to get there. That's a reasonable effort. But what an active effort would be then is for that welfare worker to schedule, to actually work with the victim, to schedule the victim, uh, to schedule a tribal victim advocate to meet with the parent and the child and to provide transportation if necessary. That's an active effort. I'm not just giving you a list. Here, let me set you up. Let me help you set up the appointment. And if you need transportation, I will take you there myself. Uh, a reasonable effort, again, might be to unilaterally create a case plan for the family. And I think we see this uh, quite a bit, is that the state agency worker is going to create that, that case plan for the parents. And it may or may not include victim services. It may or may not be trauma responsive. It may be only dealing with parenting issues, uh, and that's done unilaterally by the caseworker. There's no involvement of anyone, uh, of anyone else, including the parents. Active efforts means that uh, a tribal representative and a victim advocate uh, are there to help create a case plan that includes custom and tradition where it's appropriate. So if there's, uh, if there's tribal programming, uh, or tribal services available that, that can address and incorporate the custom and tradition and have uh, real meaning for, for the family, um, then that's preferred. That would be an active effort. So you can see the distinction between the two. Uh, <clears throat> as, with, uh, as for tribes and the application of active efforts, act, active Active efforts, uh, easy for me to say, have been recognized as the gold standard for child uh, for social service practice, offering stronger efforts at reunification and kin kinship placement, and better chance to minimize trauma. So, these active efforts lead to this gold standard. Now, there's really no reason why the gold standard should be reserved for tribal kids. The gold standard. And, and all of these considerations should be made for every child that's in a child welfare system. But those, uh, you know, those non-native kids are, are only subject to state law. And so if that's not, if active efforts are not built into state law, uh, they may not be provided for non-native kids. But because of the requirements of ICWA, this gold standard of active efforts does apply. Uh, in, the, in the design and implementation of its own programs, tribes can define, outline, and implement active efforts. So just because the ICWA doesn't really apply to tribes, it doesn't tell tribal courts how to handle child welfare cases in their own communities, it only applies to state courts, uh, 
It doesn't mean that we shouldn't be meeting the same standards that we expect the state courts to follow as well. And, um, and in terms of discussions with states and, and trainings that we've had with state courts and, and um, others within the state responsible for implementing ICWA, it's kind of a, a similar um, and often heard question, which is, you know, why would we, why do we have to implement this different standard? Because of course they've got their protocols and, and, and standards that they use for all of the other cases. And so a response to that would be, why wouldn't you? If you know that this particular set of standards as an act of efforts represents um, a gold standard in, in which reunification and, and, and placements um, are designed and implemented in order to minimize trauma, why wouldn't you implement it? Um, and, and in terms of another question that comes up, which is, well, what's the difference? Well, can you give us responses or examples? Tribes have the opportunity, if they set up their own protocols and examples, to offer that. Um, so when in, if you are working with a system or you hear the question, if a tribe takes um, the opportunity to set out its own standards, what that may include, then they have a response. Exactly. Um, <clears throat> So um, as tribes are designing and implementing uh, these, um, these active efforts into their, into their own programming, um, these will not only be used internally in every case, just like we expect the state, but as part of tribes' interaction with state agencies and courts, including uh, interventions and transfer requests or decisions. So just as Linnell was saying, um, here, we can give you examples. We have implemented this active effort in our process, and here's how it works for us. It could be something regarding placement. It could be something regarding housing or food services or, or uh, trauma and, and uh, victim safety services. Uh, any of those things uh, could be incorporated into the tribe system that the state either doesn't offer or is not culturally sensitive. And so the tribe can demonstrate that here we have these. We, you can use them if you want. You know, come and come and feel free to use our services as part of your case plan, uh, or you can develop those for yourself. So the uh, next step, and one of the steps in the ICWA process for state court implementation is application of suitable placement standards. This is, of course, placement for any out-of-home placement at, at the stages of the process that includes pre-adaptive, adoptive, and foster care placement, both emergency, temporary, um, and then you know, post-judification placement of foster care. The preferences must be applied, which must conform to the prevailing social and cultural standards of the Indian community. The guidelines and requirements of, of ICWA provide for um, tribes to adopt their own placement preferences. And um, so the, they're offered within the ICWA, of course, as to what are the applicable placement preferences if a tribe does not have them. Um, and it goes down those requirements, and but it also provides for um, these are the placement options if a tribe does not adopt. So though ICWA offers its own, there's also the potential for adoption of placement preferences by tribes. And there is an opportunity through um, implementation of other federal programs, such as Title IV-E, for the implementation of foster care programs by tribes in order to um, implement those foster care preferences or other placement preferences that a tribe may adopt. Um, and there's also an opportunity for adoption of procedures for identifying extended family and fictive kin. Um, so tribes can decide um, whether or not the, the placement preferences offered by ICWA are suitable for their purposes, um, decide if they're not, what, how to differentiate from, from those requirements and then adopt their own preferences. As with the notice standards, it's a factor also of getting that information out to state courts and to state agencies to let them know, hey, these are, if you are dealing with a 
uh, child from our tribe, these are our placement preferences. And then there's opportunities across other programs such as Title IV-E, and then also extended opportunities now with Families First and implementation of Title IV-E to um, have foster care program implementation, and that includes licensure across state lines. Um, there was just recently an article in uh, the Bismarck Tribune about North Dakota tribes signing an updated agreement um, for implementation of Title IV-E's provisions, and that includes authorizing the tribe to license foster care placements outside of the reservation boundaries. So that increases the opportunity for placement preferences that the tribe would like to see, and it also includes the option of, um, increases the opportunity for placement with families, um, even if those families have moved off the reservation for whatever purpose, for jobs or for other reasons. Um, and that, so that increases the opportunity for extended family and fictive kin placement through the implementation of that agreement. So placement preferences, um, the requirement is, of course, these are the, the sets of standards for which placement will follow, and we will follow them unless there's good cause existing to not follow them. Um, and those good cause can, can include requests of one or both of the parents. Um, if they attest they have reviewed those placement options, um, the extraordinary physical, mental, or emotional needs of the child. And so in terms of tribal interaction and, and what systems can respond, just as you can decide and define what you think for um, active efforts, you can take a look at um, what would be the guidelines for placement. And so you can offer opportunities for looking at what a tribe would consider, what's included within placement preferences, and who can handle those preferences. Um, and that also includes the transfer discussion that we had about the um, consideration of best interests of the child um, for your own policies and procedures. If, in fact, the state has more services for a particular child and their needs, or a particular victim and their needs, um, then the placement up standards, just like the transfer, can be looked at as, well, it would be better for this particular family, it would be more trauma responsive, or it would provide better services um, to have this placement be X, Y, or Z, um, just as you would not consider transfer if the services are not available. So for instance, um, let's say that, that a child is in the, in the state child welfare system based on an event that took place in the family home off the reservation where the child's, um, one child, uh, one of the parents uh, committed domestic violence against the other parent. Um, while the um, preference that's, uh, that's required by ICWA is placement with a member of the Indian child's extended family, it may not be in the child's best interest to have the child placed with an extended family member of the batterer's family. Uh, and so it may be better to have uh, the, um, the child placed with, with the, the victim's family, extended family. Uh, but if there is no available victim's family, there's only available uh, batterer's family, uh, then that could be good cause not to follow that placement. Um, and that example um, from Jan, of course, is in response, a good response to the question about victim advocate involvement in the determination. Um, tribes, of course, are going to and should set their placement options and preferences. Uh, victim advocates' role in the, that, as well as with the social services, is the trauma-informed part. If you have information about, of course, the victimization of the non-offending parent and their relationship with the offending parent's family, then, you know, getting that information into the discussion can help decide placement preferences and, and availability for a child if that extended family is likely to be a further um, traumatic um, impact on a child or a family. <coughs> so, um, 
The, uh, the last topic that we wanted to discuss the, that we out of the laundry list we provided there was, <laughs> was uh, regarding the qualified expert witness provisions of ICWA. And this applies to both state and tribal courts, I think. Uh, I mean, obviously, the requirement for a qualified expert witness only applies within a state court setting. Uh, but this is important information for tribes to know as they address um, the requirements of ICWA and what tribes can provide in order to assist state courts in the compliance with ICWA. A qualified expert witness uh, is a person qualified to address whether continued custody with a parent will result in serious emotional or physical damage to the child. So it could be a social worker. It does not have to be a social worker. Um, but that individual will have to have some sort of expertise that the court can recognize where they have the ability to make that determination uh, whether that continued custody will result in serious emotional or physical damage to the child. Um, the qualified expert witness should be qualified to testify about the prevailing social and cultural standards of the child's tribe. Now, notice that that is a preference in ICWA. It is not a requirement. They are required to be qualified to talk about, uh, about the uh, emotional or physical damage to the child. But that particular witness is not necessarily required to testify about prevailing social and cultural standards of the, of the child's tribe. So there, there doesn't have to be only one qualified expert witness. There could be more than one witness. One could be a social worker, not the case social worker. It has to be someone other than the case social worker. Uh, but. Um, there could also be a second individual, a witness, expert witness, who can come in and talk about those prevailing uh, social and cultural standards of the child's tribe. And that may mean things like a recognition of, of traditional or cultural child-rearing practices within the community. Um, there could be an individual, and, and there is now, there, there are programs out there, there are grant funds available, grant programs available, and many tribes have taken it upon themselves to develop their own qualified expert witnesses. They train them, they teach them about the requirements of ICWA, and these are individuals usually from that particular tribal community who have the knowledge of custom and tradition within that community. And they train them and teach them how, how to go to a state court and testify regarding those issues. So a qualified expert witness needs to, should be able to talk about that um, but it doesn't have to be one single expert witness. Um, a QEW uh, may be a person designated by a tribe, so to the extent that the tribe has, has identified an individual and trained an individual and informed an individual about how to be a qualified expert witness, uh, it doesn't mean a state court has to use them, but uh, this, the tribe can, can let them know uh, let the court know, look, this individual is available. We're happy to, to make sure that they participate in the process. So that if, if a state court or state child welfare agency is having trouble locating someone who can talk about those prevailing social and cultural standards of the tribe, um, they can simply tap into the tribe's QEW. Uh, the court or any party may request assistance from the tribe or a BIA office to locate a QEW um, but again, the regularly assigned state social worker in that case may not serve as a QEW. Tribes uh, should develop a list of preferred QEWs. So you may have, uh, you may not have a single person within the tribe who can serve that function, um, but you should have at least one. Um, so again, this is this, the, tr the tribe's opportunity to create protocols regarding the qualifications of who can serve as a QEW in a state court proceeding, uh, and tribal procedures on notification of request for assistance and a process uh, for response. So again, uh, if there is a request that comes from the state agency or the state court saying, you know, we, do, can, you, can you offer us up somebody to serve as a qualified expert witness, you should have some formal procedure internally in place 
in the tribe to address that request or notification. Uh, and as I indicated, many tribes have developed training and recruitment programs uh, for their QEWs. And so this is also one of those areas where you've got the opportunity for cross-systems response. Um, if you've got, as, as Jen was saying, it doesn't have to be just one person, um, and also just doesn't have to be anyone who social services trained. Um, if you are an advocate, either a child advocate or a victim advocate, this is, um, there, there's opportunities there for training programs and order and to have those persons listed as um, available um, QEWs in order to be both involved in the process and to be uh, a trauma-informed response uh, to questions about um, emotional or physical damage potential for placement. Again, that, uh, and that's again why we why we emphasized earlier that the kind of wraparound concept to have uh, have a protocol in place within the tribe. So when the notice of, of an ICWA case comes in, uh, then then someone can call together all of the services that are available. They can they can call in behavioral health. They can call in uh, housing assistance. They can bring in the the uh, the victims advocates. Uh, to, to start working on a collaborative plan to offer to the state court uh, to um, to demonstrate services and program available to the to the children and family, uh, which is why uh, tribal uh, placement with a tribal family would be appropriate or transfer to the tribal court would be appropriate. And so to um and after looking at you know the available options and potential um, recommendations for how tribes can implement best practices and in, in ICWA related matters um, with domestic violence and interaction between domestic violence and child welfare, we thought we'd wrap up by looking at some hopeful <laughs> notes <laughs> um, of best and promising practices and collaborations. Um, so what we found out there are in terms of ways in which tribes are working with states and states are seeking to work with tribes um, to implement ICWA. There are the formal processes through um, collaborations through domestic violence, um, advocates and, and requirements, ICWA and other agreements. Um, so uh, as with implementation of VAWA and the special criminal jurisdiction, there are tribes out there and states out there looking for ways in which they can make those um, requirements work together. So for instance, in tribes developing um, enforcement of protective order protocols under possibly their special criminal jurisdiction um, under VAWA, there's ways to do that formal collaboration agreements with states and, and how those processes will um, go about. And so for instance, you know, um, states have different rules about protective orders and whether or not they include any, any mention of um, custody or placement of the child, mm -hmm. and so those uh, types of agreements and collaborative efforts can and take into account uh, child placement and or ICWA concerns. Uh, there's, of course, ICWA transfer agreements and protocols that have been developed between states and tribes that try to set out um, bet between the two entities some of these internal protocols that we recommended, such as how will transfers occur, when will they occur, what are the, what are the guidelines that we can agree on. And um, there's collaborations through improvement programs such as grants that are you know, grant funded or in other ways. Uh, the National Council had um, a family court enhancement project that is just recently going to be wrapping up in which that was um, part of some of the, the issues in discussion, which is how can, um, how can we collaborate between systems to improve overall systems response. Um, and there's a citation there on the um, the slide there for you to take a look. There's, in particular, Hennepin County uh, court site of the, the FSEP site um, took a look at um, interaction between the state court in Hennepin County, which is right outside of Minneapolis, and the tribal community, which is one of the largest urban populations of American Indians in the country. And, and there are, um, they come up infrequently, I think it's a five-year cycle, but there are uh, federal grants available through the Children's Bureau. 
uh, four ICWA collaboration courts. Um, and currently, the three uh, most recent awardees uh, were um, in North Dakota, and that's a statewide project between the North Dakota courts and uh, Child Welfare uh, Agency and uh, a couple of the, at least two of the tribes uh, there in North Dakota, uh, but it's designed to implement to, to incorporate all of them. Uh, the same is true with Oklahoma, which uh, again is going to be a statewide collaborative system uh, that in, is going to include all 30, uh, 39 tribes in, in Oklahoma. And then there's a specific grant in Minnesota for St. Louis County in the Duluth area dealing with uh, the four major tribes in that particular area. So that's not a statewide, that's, that's a particular county process, but, um, but those grants are available through the Children's Bureau. We're coming up, I think, on uh, year four, so the, it's going to be time uh, in the next year or so to see those uh, grant uh, solicitations come out. And so if, uh, if anyone is interested in, in working with their state to, to have these, to have the federal uh, dollars behind this collaborative effort, then keep your eye out for that as well. And of course, that includes other um, collaborations through other statutes. We, we of course, were focused here at um, ICWA, but uh, mentioned briefly the North Dakota Agreement. Those are collaborative efforts uh, in a formal level with states and, and, um, and or, well, states, say for under Title IV-E um, and Social Security funds that can be uh, focused in on foster care placement. There are, of course, other funds that are available through Title IV-E and Title IV-B that address other parts of the social services system and support system and trauma responses uh, services. And, of course, the Families First, which was recently passed, and it's, it's focused, again, on um, services rather than removal, offers other opportunities for tribes to have formal collaborations with states and receive funding for services that can help not only to implement ICWA's provisions, but to overall um, provide services to address um, domestic violence victims and their children. Yeah, certainly that's available for uh, for tribes that have uh, that are participating in various um, VAWA or uh, OVW uh, grants that are available uh, to address domestic violence situations as they uh, develop their programming. Uh, under those grants, uh, including, as Linnell had mentioned, the Special Domestic Violence Criminal Jurisdiction under VAWA, um, then, again, all of this can be incorporated. Uh, that can be a part of uh, use the federal funding from those grants to, to help create these collaboratives and protocols that will be in place. Um, so you've got the formal collaboration, of course, at the tribal state level, which is you know, the government-to-government -government discussions that go on um, in the formal settings. But you've got the informal collaboration at local levels, and that's through relationships. Now, I, I understand and, and have been um, and worked in an Indian country in which there are no such relationships. <laughs> and I understand that those are difficult at best, and the history there can be um, imposing. Uh, but there are places and, and relationships where, where tribes have been able to develop through the social services agency or through some other informal mechanism um, the understanding of protocols um, to do early notification in state or tribal welfare cases and get those cases to the people who can provide the quickest services and, and, and to victims and children. Um, that I, I worked for quite a while here in Nevada with the tribe and, and had success there on the local level where you would get a phone call. Um, social services agencies are aware of um, lands within their communities where that are tribal lands and or with those families and if you have somebody who is working with you and can pick up the phone, then the cases don't have to get down the formal track and they can be transferred efficiently and quickly and services applied as quickly as possible, thereby minimizing trauma to everyone who's been um, affected. And you know, building those relationships, I understand, are difficult, but there's an opportunity there if it's possible. And that includes um, collaboration of services. So not only do you, hey, I know I've got a kid who's um, from your tribe and I'm giving you a heads up if you want to provide services or step in, but also if everybody getting together at that stage and, and talking about, okay, who's got what? Who's got available? Where do you have funding? Who's got services to address this, that, or other need of this family? 
um, because the tribe may have access to funding um, for certain services that the state doesn't and vice versa. And so um, pursuing those relationships if possible or trying to build them across lines that I understand could possibly be difficult, but there are opportunities uh, for families that can be um, helped through that process. And then um, for DV, of course, is better protocols for screening. Um, and an understanding that screening for domestic violence should occur both with adults and children, and that the cases may not present themselves to you as domestic violence cases, and that's why we always, um, uh, with the Resource Center, talk about screening as a best practice in all matters in which um, government services or agencies become involved. And they can be used in across the systems. In somebody coming to the clinic um, for healthcare that isn't necessarily emergent, in an education system, in the mental health services, in any family services or victim services agency, and the criminal justice system. And that includes that screening can lead to improved interventions to um, assist exposed children better safety planning targeted at children's safety, and, and then, of course, the evidence-based trauma-informed programs to help children cope. So the better your screening protocols and the more adaptive they are across agencies and systems, the more likely you are to be able to um, identify potential issues and trauma to children quickly, um, better understand if there's domestic violence involved in a child's case, and therefore, of course, improve your ability to respond. Absolutely, and that's, uh, not only is that important to do between jurisdictions, between tribal jurisdictions and state jurisdictions, but it's also important to do internally within our tribes. Uh, you can, again, either do it formally, you know, very often, and it's not, it's not unique to tribal, tribal governments, is, is the concept of silos. You know, different, different de departments are, are siloed and, and just kind of, uh, unresponsive to, to the other departments. And, and that does not lead to, to effective collaboration, particularly when we're looking at the safety of, of kids and families. Um, but um, to the extent that you can, you can start breaking down those walls and being more collaborative, uh, even if it starts on the individual level, on the interpersonal level between, uh, between individuals, that's always the first step. And, and it's uh, all meant to, to uh, to make a more effective system to address the needs of our children and families. And so we are wrapping up here. Um, it looks like we do have a few minutes if there are available questions, um, but just in case there are not, and also since we have those minutes, the National Council, um, we've got some resources here for you, of course, which are the federal, the ICWA itself, the guidelines um, and the federal regulations. Um, but there are additional resources that the council has developed. Um, the council has what we call our ICWA benchbook, and that's a guideline for judicial officers in the implementation of ICWA. Um, but we have found it fairly popular within um, all of the agencies and programs that interact with um, state um, ICWA um, implementation and, and courts. Um, because it basically provides information to advocates and social services agencies about what it is that a judge is looking for, um, which is always helpful for everyone who's involved in those cases. Yep. And so there's a link to it. Um, we also offer um, printed copies, so if you'd rather have paper or um, you think that would be helpful to your agency or program, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. Uh, if you go to the website link there, there's also information on how to contact us. Um, we also have other resources that would be available as if you're an advocate or working in other victim services. Um, we have a self-represented litigant series that looks at and tries to provide assistance to those who are working their way through the system without legal assistance, um, which we know can be fairly scary, especially for victims. And so we have some resources that are available for that. Um, we have some checklists. Um, that are also judicial uh, focused but can be useful across um, agencies for children and youth exposed to violence, um, as well as promoting perpetrator accountability and dependency cases. Um, those all also can be found at the Resource Center. 
um, at the links provided, you will see, um, and it, there's easy guidance through there, and if you have any problems, um, feel free to contact us, and we actually have our contact information on our last slide. And then um, since we did this first presentation, we now have a new um, two-page um, is, um, issuance from the Council on Tribal Courts in ICWA. If you go to the MCJFCJ website um, and go to the resources page, you will see a bunch of links to different um, documents that have been developed that provide the, both the policies and, and some guidelines about what the Council has done and is doing in the realm of um, tribal courts in ICWA, and you can find it there. So we're uh, open to any questions, uh, and hopefully we'll have answers. <laughs> That's always the hope. Yes. And if there are none, uh, we don't want to stop you as you're thinking about your question. But uh, if not, then we certainly uh, have enjoyed having this time to share this information with you. And it was great to, to provide it in person, but it's uh, even better, I think, to do it this way because uh, this will live on and others can view it as well. Yes, and I think as Anna said at the beginning, you can download the presentation material um, on your screen, and if you have any further questions, please feel free to reach out. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.